Guess who's back? Back again. Katie's back. Tell a friend. <laughs> inside number 23 my podcast which is all about knitting and sewing and generally living the craftiest life possible my name is Katie and you can find me pretty much everywhere on social media as Miss Lavelli although I am most active on Instagram so I would recommend following me there we also have a Ravelry group for the podcast which is where you can get involved with things like giveaways and knit alongs and all of that good stuff and um, if you do want to contact me directly regarding anything about the podcast so for for example sponsorship or prize donations do please drop me an email at katie at inside number 23.com and I will get back to you as soon as I can. I am coming to you as always from just north of London in the UK, Hertfordshire, where I live with my husband Emrys and our lovely pug puppy Rolly and I'm really really excited to be back with you again this week. Thank you so much for bearing with me after my two week hiatus, I know some of you were a little concerned when there wasn't an episode last week but I am back and I'm happy to be here and I have loads of good stuff to share with you. The reason I wasn't with you last week is kind of multifaceted, I would say. Um, the new job is going incredibly well, so thank you again for all of your love and support regarding that. But starting a new venture is always a little bit uh, stressful, shall we say. Um, on top of that, I have been decorating a lot. I am still pretty much up to my elbows in paint and filler and everything. I'm currently sitting in my sewing room, which the entire contents of the study have been moved into this room which is one of the smallest rooms in the house so everything feels a little bit messy and intense and the walls are coming in and that type of thing <laughs> but it's all good it's all very very positive um super happy with how the decorating is turning out it's just everything is kind of in turmoil right now um kind of involved with that I did feel a little bit burnt out last week I wasn't feeling creatively inspired I didn't really feel um like I wanted to pick up any of my current projects and that of course is quite sad it's quite depressing when you feel like that although I do feel that it's entirely normal every so often to get those kind of feelings but rather than push it too hard and put out an episode with not very much content which I kind of felt bad about um, I decided to take a week off to refresh to recharge and so I'm back again with you this week um, feeling much better and with some really really fun things to share so let's just crack on with it shall we I'm starting off this week as always with what am I wearing and yes it's an oldie but a goodie it is the robe blue a dress by dear and doe whenever I share this dress I feel really sad because it's currently out of print although I have it on good authority that this pattern is going to be re-released this autumn so bear that in mind but this is the second version of the robe blue a dress that I made um, it is if you don't know a kind of mini skirt dress a shirt waisted dress um, I adapted the collar of this one um, and almost every version of this dress that I've made to have a little Peter Pan collar because that's the style that I prefer um, and I also did contrasting fabric for my little cuffs here. This dress was made specifically for me to take away to Disney World last year at Halloween time hence the slightly um, Halloween-y print. I bought this fabric at a stall at the knitting and stitching show last year and I just I really love it. It's the cutest thing. Um, this dress doesn't get enough airtime in in life in general just because it is more Halloween based but even though we are kind of midway through August the weather here is starting to feel a lot more autumnal so I'm just you know preparing myself for the sweet glories of autumn and Halloween and all of that good stuff by wearing this dress and it's making me incredibly happy but I think it's about time I share with you some of the projects I've been working on, don't you? I mean, it has been two weeks since I talked about some knitting projects. So I'm gonna crack on with what's on my needles. 
As I said, I have been feeling incredibly under-inspired when it came to my knitting projects. One of the problems that I have been having um, that I talked about on previous episodes is um, I was experiencing a lot of discomfort, a lot of neck pain and back pain, which was being exacerbated by knitting. And that basically put a halt to all of the projects that I was currently working on when that happened. Um, I was in a lot of pain, um, generally feeling a bit rubbish and not wanting to reach reach out for the needles at all, which for me is incredibly unlikely um, and very, very out of character. So I tentatively um, considered going through some of my more languishing whips to get me more in the mood for knitting. Now this can be a slightly dangerous area to go into for my own kind of mental health because my languishing whips really, really upset me. I have quite a lot of sweater projects on the needles, as you'll know if you've been watching for a while, that haven't been touched in, I mean, months, some of them. Some of them, you know, were started years ago and still haven't been completed. And I, like a lot of people, find that kind of thing very weighty on my conscience. I think I've spent a lot of money on the supplies, on the patterns, and I'm not finishing the project, I'm not actually doing what I'm supposed to do with the thing that I've invested this money in. Also, as you'll be able to see behind me, I have recently acquired a rather lovely selection of new yarns and having these old works in progress kind of um, sitting around was, was just making me feel that I couldn't reach out to any of these new projects, however much I wanted to, while they were still kind of lurking over my shoulder as it were. So I decided to go for a project that I started at kind of a similar time last year. And again, in the vein of Halloween <laughs> and my trip to Florida, this was one of the projects that I cast on to take with me to Florida um, when we went uh, in August of last year. In October of last year, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting my months confused. Um, and I managed to do a little bit of work on it then, was totally in love with the project, but I haven't touched it since. Again, in the Halloween theme, it's in my um, kind of hammer horror project bag, which I made myself. Again, this bag was made for me to take to Florida last year, all very on topic, all of these Floridian um, makes that I have. And the project is a particularly glorious pattern by the equally glorious Michelle Wong. This is actually the first of Michelle's patterns that I have ever worked on, and I haven't cast on one since. I have so many plans to do so, but I kind of felt that I couldn't start a new one of her projects until I had finished this one. So, it is the Wickerwork Pullover, and this pattern is really gorgeous. It's a pullover that is knit in pieces, as is Michelle's preference when it comes to writing patterns. And I'm going to show you kind of how much I had done when I pulled this out of my project bag less than a week ago to get started on it again. So I had been working on the back piece of this pullover and I had done about this much of the knitting. So Ah, I know, I know, it's amazing already. This yarn, I love it so much. This is the Honey Colourway um, by Quince & Co. This is their Lark base, which is a worsted base, 100% um, American wool, I believe, and I love it. This kind of colour will forever remind me of Eric of the Sticks Plus Twine podcast. Um, it's very much his kind of colour, but I adore it. And this sweater is going to be absolutely incredible. It's It looks like it's a very intricate cable pattern that is on the entirety of this sweater, but it is actually quite intuitive. And I found that only after a couple of repeats of the patterns, I had memorized the pattern. So it is amazing and I love it so much. Plus this yarn, oh, I love working with this yarn. The only other time that I have used Lark is when I knit my, um, my void shawl in it and it is equally wonderful in that I can't wait to have a completed sweater in this same yarn and to be honest with you guys I don't think that that's going to be very long because within a matter of days I had completed the back piece here it is aha and 
the front piece <laughs> and my first sleeve piece <laughs> oh my goodness so yes this this pullover is literally flying off my needles it's it's like I can't knit it fast enough at the moment so I am currently working on the second sleeve um, which is here. I am knitting this on uh, Knit Pro Symphony needles. They are the rosewood uh, needles. They're all kind of multicolored. They are on an interchangeable cable. And I bought these specifically to take on the plane with me to Florida <laughs> because I didn't want them taken away from me and they weren't. So that was useful. And to be honest, they've been really nice to knit with. I don't often knit with wooden needles. Um, metal needles are my preference, but um, I'm really enjoying working on this and as you can see at the rate that I've been going through this sweater it's very clear that I've been kind of finding a lot of pleasure in knitting it. However I have come upon a little snag in this project um, that left me feeling quite disheartened because I was on a roll with it and that is this teeny tiny little cake of yarn is the only yarn that I have left. Um, I am not even kind of halfway through the second sleeve um, and I am playing serious yarn chicken, which I know for a fact that I am not going to win. This was the all that was left of the allocated yarn that was specified in the pattern. And it was a relatively long time ago that I purchased this yarn. So I tentatively got in touch with Loop London where I purchased the yarn from originally and I asked if there was any of the original dye lot still available. And unfortunately there was not. So I have ordered a new skein of Quince and Colac from uh, Loop in London. And I would say the color is not entirely off. It's very, very similar. Um, Quince & Co, I think, is relatively consistent in their dye lots. However, I can tell that there is a difference between these two. It's very slight, like I said, and in the light you can't really tell, but there is a difference. Now, I could let this get me down and I could get depressed about it, but I have decided what I'm going to do is cake up this yarn and start to stripe it with this yarn for the rest of the sleeve um, and just be happy with that and call it a day. Um, it's not something that I'm going to, to kind of go back and undo the entire sweater and um, or maybe undo the whole sleeve. I mean, that's a possibility. I could frog back the whole sleeve and just do the entire thing, alternating skeins of yarn, but I don't really know if I can be bothered. It took me a long time to get this project out of <laughs> hibernation and I'm really happy that it's out. What I think I'll do I'm going to cake this up this afternoon and start striping it in and see how it looks. If it's an incredibly obvious stripe, I may have to stripe the entire sleeve or I don't really know. I'm just going to play it by ear because the last thing that I want is for this project to go back into hibernation because it started me on a kind of whip finishing frenzy, which I really, really hope is going to continue. I have one other work in progress that I'd like to share with you this week and again this is a new project. So you may or may not remember that recently I went on a bit of a sock knitting kick. All I wanted to knit was socks. Um, that has kind of waned a little bit and I'm not really feeling the, the sock knitting mojo as much as I would. However, what I really wanted was something small and portable that I could still be able to knit on the go that isn't as massive as say my wicker work pullover which is relatively huge <laughs> so I was hugely inspired by Ellie of Skein Deer Knits hi Ellie um when I saw her recently at Fiber East it was really really lovely to catch up with her and she encouraged me if you may or may not recall to purchase some really gorgeous fingering weight yarn for the purpose of making some colour work mittens and I'm excited to say I passed them on now the pattern that I used is a pattern from a really really funny pattern designer called Drunk Girl Designs on Ravelry she has quite a few um, mitten patterns on there and I would say some of them are 
adult in their content. In particular, the pattern that I have chosen does use, shall we say, some salty language, some fruity language. And for that reason, I will be showing you some of it, but not all of it, because I know that not all of you are as relaxed with language as, as I am, and I respect that you may show this podcast to your kids, that type of thing. Um, so bear in mind, there will be no fruity language or anything like that on the podcast. But the pattern, if you want to look it up, is called the How Cold Is It Mittens. And I have made quite a bit of progress. I can show you the back because that is safe. But isn't this adorable? Look at it. I am loving it. So the yarn that I used is Tuku Wool in these two colours. And the thing that I would say straight away all of my issues with colour work, I now realise, have come from the fact that I haven't been using the right yarn. And I remember talking to Ellie about this in um, Edinburgh when we were at the Yarn Festival earlier, earlier in the year. One of her main pieces of advice about colour work is making sure that you're using the right yarns. And I now totally understand what she means, because these are fabulous. Tuku wool is finished wool, which has this slightly toothy texture to it, which means that it grips the yarn. So when you're doing colour work, it's so much easier to actually kind of get definition in your stitches and have your stitches um, sit nicely next to each other. So I am going to show you the front of the mitten, which is really the most intricate part. Um, it will be censored. Here's the front. It's still really, really gorgeous. I really love it. The detailing on this design is so pretty. I'm really just thrilled with it. and I'm very happy with how quickly it's growing. My one concern is that it may end up being a little bit small for my hands. I do have quite large hands. I've been trying it on as I go and it seems to fit quite nicely. And to be honest, if anything, I'd rather it be a little bit snug to start out with so that it can kind of uh, stretch to fit as I wear it. Um, but yeah. That's how we're going at the moment. It's incredibly cute. I'm gonna poke myself in the eye with a needle, I'm sure. But as you can see, it's not really as long as I'd like on the cuff. If I do these kind of pattern again, I will definitely do a couple more repeats on the cuff because I do like quite a long cuff um, with things like gloves and mittens, but I think it's going to fit. It is gonna need a good block once it's finished just because I want all of the little bumps and irreg irregular irreg irregularities, oh my goodness, irregularities to be all evened out. But to be honest, using this yarn has already resolved that a lot of the way. And I just, I love it so much. It's very toothy. Just putting this against my face, this is not something I would want near my face. But again, maybe with blocking it will soften, with wear it will soften, but it's perfect for mittens. I absolutely love it. I very much recommend the, um, the pattern. Um, I'll show you the safe side again. And um, I just really, really love it. I'm enjoying it so much. It's the perfect project um, just to pick up and knit a couple of rows in front of the TV because the pattern progresses really quickly and I'm really, really enjoying it. I can't wait to um, knit some more colour work mittens. Um, I don't think I'll be able to catch up with Ellie anytime soon in terms of the amount of knit mittens that she has, but I do want a whole selection of colour work mittens to be able to wear throughout autumn and winter and to just fill a box with them and have them because I think that they're the most beautiful thing. And they're just a lovely project to have completed. And I love it. I love it. This is definitely going to be a wardrobe staple for me. Lots and lots of colour work mittens because oh, it gives me life. In terms of my sewing this week, um, I'm a little bit sad to say I haven't completed any of my projects that I've been working on and I haven't started any new ones. And that's mostly because my sewing area is upstairs in our house. And that's also very, very close to the area that I have been doing a lot of decorating. So to protect all of my fabrics and my patterns from all of the emulsion that's kind of 
flying around at the moment, I haven't been brave enough to get started on um, kind of working on or starting a new project in terms of sewing. However, I do have a couple of little stash enhancements to share with you this week. And I'm just really, really excited um, about these. So I thought, why not just pop them in to the podcast? So the first um, stash enhancement, I have two, um, is a sewing pattern. And this is by Colette Patterns. It's been quite a long time since I've actually worked from a Colette pattern, but I saw on Instagram recently that they are going through a complete rebranding, which is very, very exciting. And it includes a rebranding of their patterns. And this is their newest pattern release. This is Penny, which is a shirt dress. It is beautiful beautiful and I can't tell you how obsessed I am with it. Um, it's very, very classy, the packaging, the rebranding I think is on point, it's amazing and I'm just in love with this pattern. From the various versions that I've seen online, this particular pattern comes with either a kind of short sleeved or a sleeveless version and the skirt you can have is either um, a gathered skirt or a wrap skirt. So there are a lot of different options in terms of this pattern. And as you know, because of this dress, um, shirt dresses are really a staple for me. I absolutely love them. I love how they make me feel. I love how they look on my body type. And this is quite different um, in terms of the dresses that I usually wear. Obviously the Rogue Blue Eye dress is slightly more A-line. This is a little bit more 50s in its styling insofar as it's nipped in at the waist and then it's a lot freer at the hips with the gathered skirt. The other thing that I love about this pattern is that it has pockets. It has pockets! I purchased this from Fabric Godmother online. So far I think that they are the only UK stockists that I've been able to find online that actually have this pattern. I'm sure that a lot of the um, larger stockists of Colette patterns in the UK will start having these but it's still a relative new pattern um, and I do think I will be doing a full review of it once I have sewn it up but as I was purchasing from Fabric Godmother which is incidentally become one of my favorite things to do um, to browse through their website um, at the moment just because they have a beautiful selection of fabrics and patterns and oh, I'm a little bit obsessed with them I thought Maybe I should have a quick look and see if there's any appropriate fabric for this dress. And oh my goodness, I found not only the perfect fabric for this dress, but just probably the most perfect fabric of all time. And that is this fabric. Oh my goodness, it just makes me die. I love it so much. So this is... Um, I believe online it's called Gold Chaffinch, the pattern, but as you can kind of see, it's this beautiful mustard yellow, and then it has these deep red flowers and teal little birds, and it is gorgeous. I am most definitely going to be using this fabric to make my version of the Colette Penny dress. And I can't wait. I know I spoke about making one of Gertie's patterns for my birthday dress. This has kind of kicked that idea out of the window. I would very, very much like to have this dress finished to be able to wear on my 30th birthday at the end of September. I just, oh, I love it and I can't wait to cut into it, which basically means I need to get cracking with all of my decorating so that I can get back to full swing when it comes to all of my sewing. But yes, new pattern, new fabric. Um, I know I've got a lot of things that I want to kind of get sewing and, and get finished. Just, just in my eyeline here are a couple of sewing whips that haven't been looked at for a little while, but I'm very, very excited to finally um, get this going. It's, it's been on my wish list ever since I saw it the first day that it was released on Instagram. And yeah, watch this space for hopefully soon a new project and um, a new review of a pattern in the pipeline. I have one more segment before we get on to the final segment of the podcast. And rather excitingly, it's going to be another edition of Resting Stitch Face this week. One of the projects that has really been getting me through my little kind of burnt out slump of creative blair. 
has been my cross stitch and I am really really excited to be able to share with you this week a finished object. I've completed the first cross stitch that I have done in a considerable amount of time and I love it. Oh this is going to be completely blown out by the camera but hopefully I will be able to insert some close-ups of this. This pattern is by Plastic Little Covers but this is the first one of their patterns that I have ever used and I love it. Um, as you can see it says office, sweet office and this is going to be hung up in the office that I am currently in the process of decorating. This I think I'm going to just display it in a um, embroidery hoop because I think that will look lovely. I like the round shape of it. This is the first time that I have ever cross-stitched on linen. and I am 100% a convert. For someone who's always used Ada fabric in the past, and for those of you who don't know, the two main fabrics that you cross-stitch on, at least that I'm aware of, are Ada fabric, which is a much stiffer, more regimented um, fabric, and linen, which is of course um, a lot more drapey, soft, floaty, and it's slightly more irregular, it's a little more rough and ready, but I much prefer how it looks, and to be honest, in terms of actually cross-stitching with it, it's so much more pleasant to do because this is not hard on your hands at all. It's very soft, it's very fluid, so I feel that I can cross-stitch for hours and hours without getting sore fingers and hands from handling the fabric. And I just love this. Oh, it's glorious. It's brought me so much happiness. All I've wanted to do um, when I get up in the morning is cross stitch, when I get home from work is cross stitch. And because I was having a bit of a rough time in terms of feeling, like I said, burnt out, I don't know how many times I can say that, um, having that kind of wake up in the morning and wanting to be creative, even in something that is not to do with knitting or sewing, has been an absolute joy and I love this pattern. Oh, it's gorgeous! Um, so yes, plastic little covers, I would very, very, very much recommend them and I particularly just love the colourways that are involved in this. It's all very kind of neons, bright, happy colours, just really, really interesting, fun designs. Now, when I finished the Office Sweet Office uh, pattern, I automatically wanted to start another project. And lucky for me, I had actually purchased a bundle from Plastic Little Covers when I purchased the Office Sweet Office pattern, which meant that I actually had two other cross-stitch patterns that I could pick from um, in terms of starting a new project. So I leapt onto that and decided to start a new one. Now this bag, which I absolutely love, um, was sent to me by Shiver Tots. I just have to give it some airtime because it has such adorable doggies on it and I love it. It has become my cross stitch project bag, which is lovely. I never used to have project bags for my cross stitch, but now as I'm an avid um, project bag keeper for pretty much everything <laughs> knit wise, um, I thought why not use one of my slightly larger bags for my cross stitch. Now, the pattern that I picked uh, is I've only done a very small amount of it because most of my crafting time was taken over by the wicker work pullover, but I have started this second pattern and as you can see it says feminist. I have done all of the, the words and now I'm going to start on the patterns. So the, there are flowers both below and above the word feminist and this again is going to be a project that is going to hang on the wall in the office space that I'm in the process of decorating. This is slightly more complicated than my previous pattern, not because the pattern itself is more complicated, but because I don't have the colourways that are specified by the pattern. Um, I decided to um, save money by using a lot of the colours that I used in the previous cross stitch, the Office Sweet Office, and just kind of put them into this design and see how I got on. And so far, I mean I've done very little, um, it's been fine. I do have um, a couple of shades that are missing, but I do have quite a lot of embroidery floss in my sewing room which I'm going to go through and hopefully be able to fill those gaps. And if not, I'll just pop out and um, purchase some more embroidery floss, but I just love this. This is 
so much fun. It really, really, really is. And I'm really happy to be working on it. It's bringing me huge amounts of joy, particularly because I know exactly where these are going to go when they're finished. The problem for me, I think, when it came to cross-stitch projects in the past is that it, the process of doing them brought me huge amounts of joy, but I didn't know where they would actually end up when they were done. So to have a very specific place where these will be displayed is being is a huge help in terms of getting them done. And it means that I can really, really enjoy the process of of working on them um, and not have to think that then they're going to go unseen or they're just going to be you know at the bottom of a cupboard or something once they're done which is not something that I want so hurrah for cross stitch it's bringing me so much joy and happiness and I'm just really really glad that I have another facet of my crafty life at the moment it's just bringing me huge amounts of joy Okay guys, that is everything in terms of all of the crafty content for this week's podcast and I'm going to be moving on to my final segment which is of course General Waffle but excitingly, Emrys is back on the podcast! Yes, for those of you who have missed him, Emrys is going to be making an appearance in my General Waffle segment. We're going to be talking about some films. We recorded this a couple of days ago so technically I am now going back in time through the, the joys and the magic of editing. Thank you for watching and I am now going to hand you over to me and Emrys of the past. I hope you enjoy. Love you all. See you in a bit. Me. Hi everyone and welcome back to another General Waffle. General, General Waffle. Waffle. And look who's back with me. Yay. Hooray. It's Emrys. For those of you who don't know, this is my husband Emrys, who um, often joins me for general waffle segments, although not recently. And for it, those of you that haven't seen me recently, she didn't horribly murder me! Yay! Yay. You don't have to keep that in. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't had time for ages to actually sit down and talk about what films that we've been seeing, which is obviously what we're going to be talking about today. That's generally why Emrys turns up on the podcast, isn't it? To waffle about to films. waffle about films. <laughs> we have been to see quite a lot of different films recently, and so we decided to kind of squidge things up a little bit because we physically don't have enough time to talk about everything that we've seen. Interestingly, there are four different films that we've seen in the past several months. Um, both of both of those pairs, so two pairs of films, this is getting complicated. I always overcomplicate things. But these two pairs of films are kind of good parallels of each other because they are similar genres, but it's like one of them did the genre well and one of them didn't, didn't do so well. No. So what is the first pair that we're going to be talking about? So we have two superhero films. Mm -hmm. We have Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Brought to you by <laughs> DC. <laughs> that. I can't do the music, but best music ever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. Which is not DC. Which is Marvel. A direct comparison between Wonder Woman and Spider-Man Homecoming I think reflects one, how you can do this kind of film very, very well and one, how this kind of film falls a bit flat. For me, if you look at the way that women specifically are kind of represented in these two films, obviously Wonder Woman has had loads of praise and acclaim for presenting a strong female hero. Mm. Um, and I don't think many people have spoken about it, but Spider-Man Homecoming, the, the female characters in that do absolutely nothing to forward the story. Um, it would definitely fail the Bechdel test. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, they're not well represented characters. So I found Spider-Man Homecoming particularly difficult from that perspective as the previous comic book film that we had seen was Wonder Woman. I think in terms of women, the portrayal of women in film, I think it's a huge step forward and there are certain moments in this movie that got a very, very emotional reaction from me because I suddenly realised that I had never seen a woman portrayed in the way that Diana is portrayed in, in this movie. That moment in the film alone meant that the rest of it could do no wrong, as far as I was concerned. And the end of the film is pretty terrible, mm -hmm. but it recovers itself well enough to 
uh, still be well thought of in my mind at least. Spider-Man Homecoming um, is an interesting new take on the Spider-Man world which we probably didn't need. Um, <laughs> which is kind of a teen movie meets a superhero movie, which is a good idea. And in some cases I think it really does, yes Roly. In some cases I think it really does succeed, but in many cases probably in the majority sense it doesn't quite leave you feeling like you've seen anything new or anything different. Why remake this film again, which has now been remade so many times without really doing anything new or different or interesting and I really didn't like the villain. I thought the villain was a bit pants. So yeah, Wonder Woman! Thumbs up. What would you give Wonder Woman? I would give it three and a half. I'd give it four. Spider-Man Homecoming, how much would you give it? Two. Two! Eh. So what was the other pair of films that we saw recently? These are two films set in very different time periods, but are probably what you could loosely be referred to as gothic horror. Period drama. Period drama. Erring on the side of gothic horror, yeah. I think. The first one that we saw was My Cousin Rachel. Um, which is based on the book by Daphne du Maurier and the second one was a film called The Beguiled Directed by Sofia Coppola mm -hmm. Emrys doesn't really have a full perspective of my cousin Rachel because he did fall asleep during it For five minutes! <laughs> I really enjoyed it It's got an incredible cast uh, the costumes are incredible, the sets are incredible, the um, the scenery, the landscape where the film is, is filmed is beautiful. It, I think, basically does everything right in terms of what um, I like to see in a period drama. I thought that the way that the film was put together and directed um, really held the kind of the line of ambiguity just in the right place. The Beguiled, in stark contrast, was a real disappointment as far as I was concerned. From my point of view, I just don't know what this film was going after. Mm -hmm. Like, it felt like it was going after something, mm -hmm. but I don't know what that something was. There's so many things that it could have portrayed, and it just seemed to fall short at every possible juncture. Like, it just didn't really deliver on on any level, as far as I was concerned. I think the costumes were all right. Several people left during this film when we went to see it. We weren't quite at that point, but I was bored. Mm. What would you give My Cousin Rachel out of five? I would give it four. I would also give it four. Good movie. Um, what would you give The Beguiled? One. Me too. <laughs> We're in agreement this time. Yeah. <laughs> but now we're going to move on to the real meat and vegetables, except for us just vegetables now. <laughs> the real the real vegetables. The real vegetables and meat yeah. alternatives of what we're going to be talking about <laughs> today. And we have three movies, count them, one, two, three, to talk about. Um, and they're all really exciting. They're all very, very different. And... Yeah, they've been pretty awesome, I think, all of them. So the first film that we're going to talk about is actually not one that we saw in the cinema because a lot of really good original movies have been released recently on Netflix. It's mm -hmm. very exciting, all of these new ways of seeing films. And you can probably guess which film it is. It's it's The Circle! <laughs> no, not the, circle. not the Circle. Don't watch The Circle. It's really <laughs> not worth your time. Uh, <laughs> it is, in fact... Okya! Okya! It's had a huge amount of press. Your thoughts and feelings? Well, I have my entire life probably would have referred to myself as a carnivore because <laughs> I don't eat vegetables. <laughs> um, so this film is the film that changed that. Yeah. A really enjoyable, beautiful story of a relationship between a, a person and an animal which I'm really connected to but also, uh, I, I guess, a kind of dystopian future where we could go with food production and, you know, animals and how we use them. The, the main story is set at a time in the future when food production has become kind of ridiculous. The world is very much exhausting its natural resources. Um, there is a company that basically says that it has found a solution to all of those problems, which is these incredible majestic animals called super pigs. Um, basically they... a hippopotamus sized pig. A, a really gorgeous, amazing kind of animal. And the CGI in this movie is outstanding, mm. I would say, for the production of the Super Pigs. They are glorious. Um, and the idea is, is that these animals 
are, they don't produce a huge amount of waste, they don't eat a ridiculous amount of food, they are very very large and in terms of food production this is all pluses and it's, it's the idea is they're organic and they live in nature and there are these amazing creatures and they seem to be the answer of everybody's prayers. They're ultimately the answer to world hunger, yes. which is a huge deal. But the reality of the situation ends up being quite different. But alongside the, the kind of owner of the company who's played by Tilda Swindon, who is incredible in this film, you have kind of animal activists, you have zoologists, you have all of these different characters who are portrayed incredibly by the actors who play them. Um, but the, the main story that kind of drives this entire journey is the relationship between um, the little girl and Okia. It's had a pretty monumental effect on both myself and Emrys. We are now over over a month vegetarian. It's two months. Two months. Is it two months? It's two months. It resonated with me because of the relationship that I have with our dog, Rolly. Um, Rolly actually really enjoyed this film as well. He got very involved. I've got a picture of him watching it that I'm <laughs> going to try and insert here if I can find it. Um, but he loved it. And seeing him responding to this animal and the emotional response that I had to this animal and the way that it was being treated and the way that, in general, it appears that animals are treated within food production, my response was, if I'm getting this upset over an animal that isn't really Real. why do I not feel this way about animals that are treated this way every single day that are real? It's so worth watching just from it's it's funny, it's sad, it's dark. We just we said it's almost like a live action Studio Ghibli film. Yeah. And it feels really bizarre and almost cartoony but has the serious edge to it. Whether or not you turn vegetarian after watching it, um, I do think it's it's worth watching. Yeah. What would you give Okia out of five? I would give it four. I'd give it five. I love it so much. <laughs> I love it. Brown. <laughs> the next film we're going to talk about is another film with animals in it. I love all the animals! Um, <laughs> this <laughs> is the third part in a trilogy of films that we have been really looking forward to and I would say probably, for me, surpassed my expectations. Oh yes, me too. Um, this film is War for the Planet of the Apes. Yay! Woo! Loved this film. Just gonna put it out there. Okay, but what should everyone know about our viewing experience of this film? Oh yeah, um, <laughs> so we went to see this film in 4DX which, if you don't know, is basically a four-dimensional experience of seeing a film. So it's so like you sit 3D, a, yeah. but so you also sit in a chair. You sit in a chair that can move, and the whole bank of chairs moves. They okay. shoot water at you, they shoot smells, smells like into you. the air. Smoke. Um, the smoke. Um, I think that's kind of it. Yeah. It? Yeah. It's supposed to be a completely immersive movie experience, and the one thing that I would say about it is it is anything but immersive. By the time I had got used to being constantly thrown about and have air puffed at me and water sprayed at me, the film was basically over. So by <laughs> the time that my body had adjusted to the experience enough to have it as be an addition to the film rather than a distraction, the film was over. So I would never do a 4DX experience again. Neither of us are that big fans of 3D mm -hmm. um, because like 4DX it is designed to immerse you in the film and from my point of view all it does is remind you that you're watching a film. So mm -hmm. you can't really get lost in the story or the characters because you're constantly being, in this case, shaken around, having things blasted at you. But even if you're just watching 3D... Poked in the back as well, like yeah. when someone gets stabbed or punched, you get like punched in the back of the head and yeah. it was just... <sighs> um, not that an enjoyable experience. But I would say, e in spite of that, mm -hmm. we still really enjoyed this film. Uh, I think Andy Serkis has been sort of universally praised for this film and there's even been discussions of an Oscar nomination. I think his portrayal of Caesar is... You, it, it means so much that you can tell that it's him. Mm. You really, really can. I think he's incredible. But I think every single one of the apes in this movie is 
incredible. I, I kind of got bored with the human characters in this film. I was like, I don't want to have to watch the humans anymore. I just want to see more of the apes because they're so amazing. In particular, my, my firm favourite, who is Maurice, the orangutan. It was just great in terms of looking at humanity through a whole race of animals that aren't human. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so clever. Mm -hmm. I loved it. If you haven't checked out the two prequel films to this as well, please do. They're really, really good also. Um, I love these films. I think they're brilliant. The less said about Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes, the better. <laughs> but all of the other Planet of the Apes films, check them out. <laughs> if you want to see how not to do Planet of the Apes, watch the Tim Burton Planet of the Apes. Marky Mark. What would you give Planet of the Apes... Oh, sorry, what would you give War for the Planet of the Apes out of five? Five. Yay! Yay! Uh, cool. We have one more film we want to talk about. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this film. And that film is The Big Sick. The Big Sick. And when I've told people that I'm going to go and see The Big Sick at the cinema, they look at me very peculiarly. They're like, what? What? what kind of a name is that? And I actually remember the first time you said that we should go and see The Big Sick. I kind mm. of went, that doesn't sound like something that I want to go and see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is very different, I think, from what the um, the title makes you think that it would be. It's a, it is very much a romantic comedy for the present day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and very much based on true events. Based on true events. This blew my mind. After we watched the movie, we found out that it was pretty much 100% true. The core story in its essence is 100% true. Obviously there's a little bit of titivation around things that happen around that core story, but that essential bit is 100% real and that just blew my mind because this story genuinely doesn't feel like it could be real mm. in the slightest. It mm. feels like it's just something that's come out of someone's head. And it stars Kamal Nanjani uh, playing himself yeah. uh, and Zoe Kazan playing Emily, uh, his girlfriend, uh, who in real life is, is a girl called Emily, who wrote this film with, with her Kamal. husband, Kamal. Yeah. So we are big fans of Zoe Kazan. Yeah. She is in a couple of our favourite films. Yeah. I'm a big fan um, of Kamal Nanjari as well. Yes. Um, from... from uh, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. He is a, yeah. He's a great comedian. Mm. Um, so we were aware of both of them. Um, so that in itself kind of set this movie up for being something that we both want to watch. Yeah. But the essential story is boy Camille meets Nanjani's girl. Camille character um, is living in America with mm. his family who are constantly setting him up with sort of potential arranged marriage candidates, mm. which he's totally not into. Um, and he starts dating this girl called Emily. Um, and they have a bit of a rocky time in their relationship yeah. when she essentially finds out that he doesn't really think that they have a long-term future because of his family and their religious beliefs and their kind of hopes and dreams for him in terms of what he will do in his future, um, which doesn't involve marrying mm. an American white woman. And, and then she goes into a coma. Yes, so and a medically unfold. induced coma because she becomes really quite unwell, hence mm -hmm. the title The Big Sick. Um, and the real kind of essence of the film is him realising whilst she's asleep how he feels about her developing a relationship with her parents and changing a lot of things in his life to kind of be in a position to be with her, mm. really, I mm. think. And it's just brilliant. It's fantastic. Um, it's got Holly Hunter and um, Ray, Ray Romano. Romano. Ray, 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 Ray Romano. <laughs> it's got Holly Hunter and Ray Romano Who as turn in the most fantastic yeah, performances as, as Emily's, Emily's parents. parents. They're brilliant, and it's again. I'm not sure how much of the film was 100% scripted and how much of it was kind of improvised around, but it does have that really fresh, um, improvised feel to it. And the the core cast are all brilliant kind of comedic actors. I just think it's great. And I love the fact that it's a true story. It makes me love it even more. Mm. Zoe Kazan's outfits are incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Which is obviously something that I always want to look, just want to be Zoe Kazan. Um, and yeah, 
brilliant. It's I think of all the films that we've seen recently, this is probably the one that really, really found a place in my heart. Mm. I loved it. It does a lot to deal with what it is to be an immigrant, uh, you know, or come from an immigrant family, I should say, living in America and some of the kind of conflicting parts of that. Yeah. Um, you know, he talks a lot about you you always talk about um, how much you did and how much you went through to move me to this country and all you want to do is focus on the things that, that we left behind exactly yeah and it, yeah it's it's just it really is a beautiful film on so many levels mm -hmm. uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I thoroughly recommend you go and see The Big Sick. Of all the films that we've seen recently I think unequivocally is that a word? It is. Unequivocally the Big Sick is the one that I would recommend above all of the others, just for anybody, yeah. regardless of what your preferences are when it comes to, to movies, The Big Sick is something I would say go go and see that. Yeah. Get yourself to a cinema and see that film right now. And it's I for me it's probably one of those films that's just going to be universally enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I love the Planet of the Apes films, but I think if I had to recommend a film that I was confident anyone would like, it would be this one. What would you give The Big Sick? Wow, that's two films that we've seen recently that we both gave five stars to. Yeah, and we're harsh critics. We are harsh critics. These are good films. Maybe we're softening in our old age. Maybe we are. <laughs> Rolly definitely is. <laughs> He's asleep. Yeah. So that is everything this week, you guys, from Inside Number 23. Thank you for coming and joining me again, Emrys husband mine hopefully it won't be too long until you're back with us again yeah seriously you won't leave it this long he's been badgering me he's been like when are we gonna do a recording you happy you've done it now yeah <laughs> if you've enjoyed the video please do give us a thumbs up and um, please hit the subscribe button down below. It's my favorite button. Somewhere bit. down below here yeah. to be kept up to date when I have new videos on the channel. It's on the channel, just covering, it, so covering it the is. whole yeah. area. Just click everywhere along the bottom and you <laughs> will eventually hit the subscribe button. If you have seen any of these films and um, have any other opinions, please share them in the comments down below. Or if you have any recommendations for films that you think that we should go and see, we are always up for hearing about that type of thing. Do people ever do that? Yeah. Oh, I never heard about it. <laughs> oh, Rowley. Oh, Bob. He is a very sleepy pug. <laughs> but for now, from all of us, including a very sleepy puppy, <laughs> we hope you have an incredible week. Happy sewing, happy knitting, happy film watching. Say bye, Rony. We'll see you bye, all soon. Bye. bye. Oh, he's mad at me. How do I stop it from recording? Just press the button on the top.